In 1978, PGA Tour Commissioner Dean Beeman hired Pete Dye to design a home course for the PGA Tour. Beeman gave Dye 400 acres of swamp just south of Jacksonville and a deadline. Dye embraced the challenge by building target golf to the hilt. When the Players Stadium course opened in 1980, it was a southern version of Pine Valley with ribbons of grass edged by vast expanses of sugar sand and coquina shell, all framed by high mounds for galleries. Today, the course is more akin to Augusta National with lush, uniform rough, fluffy white sand and beds of pine straw beneath trees. But Dye's distinctive features remain, his dogleg bunkers with precise beveled edges, his rollicking green contours, his vertical wooden bulkheads where fate is determined by the single rotation of a ball. TPC Sawgrass, among Golf Digest's 100 greatest golf courses, has hosted the Players' Championship since 1982 and annually produces the strongest field in golf. This is every hole at TPC Sawgrass Players Stadium Course. Many architects want their opening hole to be a gentle introduction, but not Pete Dye, who filled half the corridor of his first hole with sand and water and turned a straight par four into something that twists and turns. The farther left you aim off the tee, the more the greenside bunker will come into play on the second shot. Therein lies a fundamental principle for playing Pete Dye golf courses. Play toward the trouble off the tee if you want the least obstructed approach shot into the green. Some call that strategic, others call it foolhardy. Dye designed his par fives to demand shot shaping in one direction off the tee and the opposite direction into the green. Good players play point to point these days so most don't fear the tree lines on the par five second anymore, or the pond and strip bunker on the right the last 175 yards to the green. But those who miss the green in any direction often end up in awkward situations where they're forced to invent a recovery shot. That's another die principle. Expect the unexpected if you miss one of his greens. Number three is the most ordinary looking hole at TPC Sawgrass with water and a cross bunker so far removed from play as to be harmless. The real trouble is on the green, which is two levels, higher in the back, separated by a long diagonal transition slope. Three putts are common here, even in the Players' Championship. The short fourth is generous off the tee, but demanding on the second shot, the only forced carry over water on any par four on the course. Dye later said he regretted digging the canal in front of the green, but he never filled it in. The back of the green is higher than the rest, with downward slopes running toward the water in front and on the left. In 2001, a year after winning the Players' Championship, Hal Sutton eagled the fourth hole twice in four rounds, both times spinning a ball off a back slope and into the cup. It's uphill off the tee to a plateau fairway, then downhill to the green on the slight dogleg right fifth. There's lots of gingerbread around the green in the form of potholes, palm trees, and one elaborately shaped bunker well short. But honestly, this is a benign green that's wide open in front because Dye knew most would be hitting approach shots with long irons or even fairway woods. For the careless, around the perimeter of the green, Dye put in a few dips that slope off in various directions. Drives from the tip of the six once played through a narrow gap between leaning pine trees just in front of the tee box but they fell down years ago. The lake on the left is relatively new. It had previously just been a moat. To add visual spice, Pete planted palm trees, held her skelter in front of both sides of this egg-shaped green, and approach shots not played from the center of the fairway must contend with them. Di called the look of the mounds and scattered bunkers around this green to be his grenade attack. For the first 34 years, the area between the parallel sixth and seventh holes was a high, long spectator mound ringed by a moat that stifled gallery circulation. In a 2016 remodeling of the course, the mound was trucked off to be used elsewhere, and the moat expanded into a full lake. Although there's a buffer bunker on the left, the water is still uncomfortably close off the tee on number seven, especially for those who want to play left to avoid tangling with a small lagoon and boomerang bunker right of the green. 
The long eighth is the toughest par three on the course during each player's championship, producing the fewest greens in regulation. Trees tied around the tees block the intensity of crosswinds, and the green rolls off in four directions toward nearly a dozen tiny traps as well as knobs and hollows of sticky rough. Nine is widely acknowledged as one of the best par fives Pete Dye ever designed. A diagonal canal crosses the fairway within range of tee shots, so some hit less than driver and others aim up the left side. Even from the center of this broad fairway, the green is half hidden behind clusters of oaks and low hillocks on the left. The green is narrow and not particularly deep, with prominent slopes front and back that repel shots. Beeman wanted the 10th to be the equivalent of the first hole, so tournament players starting on either nine would not be disadvantaged. And on paper, the 10th seems like the mirror image of the first. But 10 is a sharp dogleg left, and its gooseneck fairway ends abruptly in a deep cross bunker, so many players hit iron off the tee. The approach is often into the wind, but knobs and sand in front don't accommodate low bouncing shots. The green has ridges throughout and is a shallow target when approached from the right side of the fairway. The zigzag 11th again tempts us to play toward trouble to be rewarded, toward the massive fairway bunker left of the landing zone. It is mild compared to the original waste bunker that Dye had built on that spot. That had been filled with clumps of love grass and was the scene of many lost balls. Playing away from that bunker off the tee brings into play overhanging limbs of a massive oak on the second shot. If you're attempting to reach the green in two, that is, there's always the bailout fairway on the far left. In the 2016 remodeling, PGA Tour designer Steve Wensloff extended Dye's Pond around the back of this putting surface. This is not Pete Dye's original 12th hole, which was a sharper dogleg left around a series of high knobs. To bring more excitement to this corner of the course, Wensloff made 12 a corner-cutting, drivable par 4, with a pond at the base of a shaved bank to the left of a perched green and a hollow to the right that leaves a semi-blind pitch over a pot bunker. Wensloff insists Pete signed off on this hole, although some of the Dye family say Pete never believed in drivable par fours. They say he considered them just really long par threes. In truth, this corner of the course has never lacked excitement because the tee shot on the par 3 13th has always been a demanding carry over hazards to a putting surface with three distinct sections. A high plateau on the right, a back left shelf, and a valley in the front left. Putts down the slope from back to front can be nerve wracking with the nagging fear that a runaway putt could end up in the pond. 14, the longest par four on the course, is yet another variation of a Pete Dye zigzag hole. Any tee shot left of center puts the overhanging oak short of the green into play on approach shots. The secret here is to play down the right side away from the obvious trouble, counterintuitive on a die design, but mounds in the right-hand rough can produce a hanging lion, gnarly deep Bermuda grass. Even from the center of the fairway, the long undulating green sits at an angle and thus is a fairly shallow target. 15 is the tightest tee shot on the course, partly because there's little airspace between trees left and right off the tee, and partly because the fairway swings to the right rather quickly, demanding a controlled fade. Dye anticipated many would lay back off the tee with less than driver, so 15 green is deep to accept long second shots and mostly open in front. The right center of this green contains a prominent dip, what designers often call a thumbprint. The dogleg left 16th is another hole that has changed. When TPC Sawgrass opened in 1980, this hole had a tiny perch green beyond a cluster of prominent oaks with water well to the right and behind. Tour players complained the small size of the green made it impossible to hit and hold in two. So in 1986, Dye reconfigured the putting surface, making it lower, wider, and deeper, but extending it right to the lake's edge. Still, 16 is statistically the easiest hole in the course to birdie, which is fitting given what comes next. This is it, the Gladiator Coliseum of Golf, where thousands cheer and jeer the world's best as they take on the beast, Pete Dye's original island green. 
when actually suggested by his wife Alice. Take away the screaming masses, and the tee shot is still intimidating. Each year, the club pulls about 120,000 golf balls from this pond, an average of three per customer. By the way, that's not a new backstop behind the green. It's simply the railing of a temporary footbridge used while the narrow turf walkway was being regrassed. Anything less than a boomerang par four curving along the edge of oblivion would be anticlimactic after the previous hole. Play safe to the right off the tee and you could be beneath oaks Pete planted 20 years ago. From there, the angle into the green brings into play a jumble of humps and hollows short right of the putting surface. Dye's design rewards the courageous. Hug the lake's edge and your approach is wide open into a slope that's canted like a catcher's mitt. TPC's 17th and 18th epitomize Pete Dye's stark options. Sink or survive, goat or glory, go bold or go home.